earlier this week would have been Murray Rothbard's 90th birthday. And in celebration of the man, we held a reception at the Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C., entitled Why Rothbard Matters, where Bob Murphy spoke on the impact that Rothbard has had on his own work and why the assembled students should themselves go out and find and read Murray Rothbard. And to help them do just that, the Mises Institute has just released a new Rothbard reader, which was edited by our own Dr. Joe Salerno and by Professor Matt McCaffrey at the University of Manchester in England, who's a former fellow with us here at the Institute. So here to talk not only about the new Rothbard reader, but also about Rothbard the man, is our guest, Professor Matt McCaffrey. So if you like Rothbard, stay tuned for a great interview. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends and a special welcome to our guest, Matt McCaffrey, live this evening from England. Matt, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, Jeff. Well, so the Rothbard Reader is now available, or it will be uh, mailed, the print version will be mailed shortly. Talk to us a little bit about editing the Rothbard Reader. When you edit a book like this and you go through the voluminous work of Murray Rothbard, do you feel like you get inside his head a little bit and you get to know him a little better? Uh, yeah, you certainly do. I mean, when you start reading Rothbard for the first time, uh, it's it's overwhelming just the, the sheer volume of work that he produced. And it's on so many different subjects and uh, on so many different levels and for different audiences. I at least find it extremely overwhelming. And so when we went through uh, the editing process of this book, when Joe Salerno and I uh, were putting this together a couple of years ago, it really just drives home to you how uh, wide his understanding was, um, his learning was, um, and uh, just the, the sheer number of topics um, that he wrote on is, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's extremely humbling. But of course, even within economics itself, he's wide. In other words, he's a monetary economist, uh, really almost un an unparalleled monetary economist from the Austrian perspective anyway. But then his range goes out into movie reviews and politics and sports and philosophy. Uh, did you read a lot of material that you'd just never seen before? Oh, sure, sure. Um, and we went back and looked at his, uh, essentially his uh, complete uh, complete bibliography of his writings throughout his life. We found um, all kinds of uh, materials that uh, we didn't realize um, that, he had, that he had ever written, you know, materials, uh, as you say, on every different subject, you know, that had unfortunately been, uh, been lost. And one of the things we tried to do in this book is actually bring a few of those surprise articles um, back and get, get them published in, uh, in the public eye again. Well, so obviously his, his big opus is Man, Economy, and State, and there are selections from that contained within the reader. When I go back and look at Man, Economy, and State, which really I think represents a revival of sorts in and of itself, or, or the beginning of the new Austrian school, you know, he, he began this book in 1952 when he's only in his early 30s. He finishes it in his mid to late 30s. Isn't that pretty staggering to you to think that he, he was able to write this so young? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really incredible that he managed to absorb so much of the, the economic doctrine, uh, not just of, of, the, of the time, um, but for the, you know, the previous two centuries, that he managed to, to absorb so much of this and then put it, uh, explain it systematically in Man, Economy, and State. I mean, that, that book, I think, will always remain uh, his, his crowning achievement, certainly in economics. You think that's true of a lot of academics, that their best, their biggest achievement comes at a pretty young age, just because the, just like our muscles age, our, our mental faculties age as well? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly true uh, for some economists. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter said that it's the decade between the ages of 20 and 30 uh, that all economists do their most brilliant work. Uh, I don't think this is uh, true for Rothbard. I don't think it was true for, for Mises and, and many other great economists because they, you know, continued to uh, be, you know, extraordinarily productive economists throughout their lives and continued to add to what they had done at a very young age. And, and, and certainly Rothbard uh, falls into that pattern um, as he was a, you know, a, a very uh, productive economist, I mean, right up to the end of his life. Well, what some of our listeners might not know is that what's become sort of an addendum to the book, Man, Economy, State, called Power and Market, was originally designed by Murray to be part and parcel of the book. It contains uh, some provocative material, including a chapter entitled Defense Services on the Free Market. Talk about why and how the original publisher thought that that was a bit much and, and caused Murray to have to publish that separately. Right. Well, when Rothbard first wrote Man, Economy, and State, 
he initially envisioned it as a sort of a textbook version of Mises' human action, a more accessible version of human action. And it was as he started writing it that he started to realize that there were some topics that Mises didn't really go into in detail and that he was going to have to address these topics himself and in some cases actually develop a new sort of systematic approach to thinking about them from an Austrian economic perspective. And one of these topics uh, concerned the role of government, which is what uh, Rothbard talks about in those those chapters that are now the book, uh, Power and Market, that are, that are added to the end of Man, Economy and State. But at the time, Rothbard was breaking a lot of new ground with these arguments, arguing that, in fact, there is no economic justification uh, for government, that in fact the market can provide all of these um, so-called public goods that government usually provides. And I think uh, uh, the publisher simply uh, wasn't ready for this. Um, I think they considered it to be a little too controversial. It's also the case that coming in at the end of Man, Economy, and State, the book was already uh, extremely long, you know, a thousand pages. And so for those reasons, uh, the publisher asked Rothbard to cut a lot of those sections, or at least trim them down a great deal. Um, and so Rothbard sort of took those chapters out and kept them on the side and then published them later as the standalone book, Power and Market. Um, but fortunately now, because of the Mises Institute's reissuing of the Scholar's Edition of Man, Economy and State, those two parts um, have been brought together again uh, the way that Rothbard originally intended. Well, you mentioned that it's that this book is perhaps more accessible than human action. I, I hear this a lot, that man, economy, and state is less daunting and hence a better introduction for the reader than human action. Do you think that's really true? I mean, I, obviously, part one of human action is, can, can be difficult conceptually, but I almost find man, economy, and state a bit more technical you know, than human action. There's more graphs. Um, I won't say it's mathy, of course, but it's it seems to me a little more traditional in its approach to economics than human action. Uh, relative to some other Austrian work. I think that's correct. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it was originally conceived as a kind of textbook version of human action. And it's for that reason that it has this sort of technical element to it. Um, as you said, it, it's not um, too dense. It's not like uh, reading, say, you know, a, a mainstream economics textbook. Um, I think it is more intuitive and more engaging than that. But you're right when you say that there is this element of um, we might even call it a dryness in some of the in some of the book. Rothbard is much more careful in Man, Economy, and State than Mises was in Human Action to avoid being too value laden. Mises was is always he's insistent throughout Human Action on you know, you know champ, uh, championing the, the the virtues of a free society. Because of Mises' utilitarianism, he was um, very adamant always um, to talk about about the benefits of, of uh, society and of the division of labor and the problems with socialism. And that kind of comes, comes through in a certain sort of passion in his work. And Rothbard in Man, Economy and State, I think, is taking a more reserved tone as a teacher, um, as, a, as someone who's trying to explain these problems in a, in a very sort of sober, systematic way. Um, and, and I think that's um, why uh, sometimes uh, people might actually say that they prefer to read uh, human action um, than man, economy, and state. Matt, it's interesting that you bring up Mises' utilitarianism because, to put it mildly, Rothbard countered that perspective in his book, The Ethics of Liberty, which is still very much a libertarian standard that a lot of people read today. I wonder if you think if, if it was tough for him as an academic and someone who admired Mises as much as he did to sort of go against him and write something contrary to him, his own mentor. Oh, I, I think it certainly was. And in fact, I believe Rothbard uh, relates this, the story of when he first criticized uh, Mises in public, like criticized Mises to his face in his seminar, when he presented a paper um, that was somewhat critical of uh, Mises' utilitarianism. And I think he said that at the time, uh, his hands were shaking, uh, and he wasn't sure if he was actually going to make it through the presentation. Um, so I think it, it certainly it was difficult for him. And uh, I mean, I think it's it's challenging always for uh, for students, even exceptional students, to take issue with what 
their their mentors um, have have taught them. Because Murray wrote on so many topics, he wrote on philosophy and ethics and libertarianism and political strategy, sports and movies, everything that we mentioned before. Do you think that this hurt him in terms of his reputation as a pure economist within the profession? Yes, I think it did. Um, I you know I think the um, the broader the approach you take in academic writing and the less sense of specialization there is in your work, the less appealing it's going to be to the profession at large. Um, and this is a trend that, that still happens today. It's always harder to do interdisciplinary work than it is to specialize in very narrow topics. Um, and that's the way that the economics profession uh, and the social sciences more generally have been moving in the past few decades. And so I, I do think that to some extent Rothbard was a, was a victim of that trend. But here's what's so interesting is today Rothbard is much better known for having written non-academic work for lay audiences than, let's say, Arthur Burns, the former Fed chairman who tried to thwart his mass his uh, PhD thesis at Columbia, right? Who can, who can name the chair of, of the Harvard Department of Economics in 1975 today, right? So isn't that ironic that Rothbard, by doing an end run of sorts around traditional academia, is actually much better read and much more popular today? It is. Uh, there is a certain irony to it, um, but I think it's a testament to the fact that Rothbard was you know, a, a talented and engaging writer. And essentially on every topic that, that he wrote on, you could at least be guar uh, guaranteed that he would be, uh, write something, you know, witty and thought provoking um, and provide, you know, some, some excellent food for thought. The fact that uh, so many of his uh, colleagues who were at the time much better known is a testament to the fact that they simply weren't able to do this. Um, specialization in this very sort of narrow academic sense, yeah, it can certainly hurt you over time. Um, I think Rothbard uh, used to say that uh, there was a problem with economists, very famous economists, specializing in doing the kind of work that they were worst at. And I don't think Rothbard ever really himself uh, specialized in anything. So that was, a, I think, a trap that he managed to avoid because he remained you know, a, a broad interdisciplinary scholar his entire life. Well, having edited this new reader, if somebody was new to Rothbard, they'd heard his name, but they weren't familiar with any of his work. They were sort of, sort of your typical libertarian with a with a healthy interest in economics. Well, what would you tell them? Where would you tell them to start? Well, th this book is designed to appeal uh, first and foremost to people who are just in this in exactly this sort of situation. They want to get more into Rothbard. You know, they're sort of curious, but he wrote so much you just don't know where to start. And so, in general, that's one of the reasons why we decided. To, to edit this book. With that in mind, um, as an economist myself, I, of course, gravitate most toward Rothbard's economic writings. And in this book, we've tried to sort of set out, um, even though it's relatively short, we've tried to use a, a small number of writings to uh, let Rothbard uh, outline his approach to economics, to economic theory, uh, but also, of course, to economic policy um, and economic history and the history of economic thought, all the different aspects uh, of the science. Um, they're all there. And for me, those have always been uh, the most compelling aspects of his work. At the same time, though, many other people uh, would, I think, prefer to jump into his political philosophy, into his more practical uh, writings on things like the libertarian movement and libertarian strategy. And so, of course, we, have, we include some of those writings as well. Well, I have to say personally, I don't believe it is one of the movies reviewed here. But because of Murray Rothbard, I went out and, and saw the movie Metropolitan a couple of years ago. And it's really interesting to watch that movie knowing that Murray loved it. It changes your perception of watching a movie after you read a Rothbard review. Uh, that's for sure. Matt, we only have time for one more question. So let me ask you a, a highly loaded question question, if I may. I would argue that today Mises' legacy is secure. In other words, even his worst critic would now acknowledge that he was a giant of the 20th century. It feels like Rothbard's legacy is not yet secured. Would you agree with that statement? And, and if so, why? I would agree with that statement. Uh, the reason is that I think Rothbard's most important contributions to knowledge in the most general sense are his contributions to economic theory as encapsulated in uh, Man, Economy, and State and a lot of his other um, sort of formal economic writings. However, even though these works are very commonly discussed, I think that they are not read closely as often um, as 
as people say. And I especially think that his original contributions in these books continue, continue to go underappreciated. You know, there, there are certain topics like his um, sort of anarchist political economy. These tend to be very popular, very widely read, um, and everybody knows the basic arguments, I think. However, what people tend to ignore are those core chapters of a book like Man, Economy, and State, the one that deal with the more mundane topics, uh, the core price theory of the Austrian school, the, the discussions of production and of monopoly and of entrepreneurship, topics that you simply cannot do without in economics, uh, and which Rothbard, in, in a sense, completely revolutionized um, in that book. Um, but sadly, those are the, the chapters that tend to be least read today um, and least discussed. And for that reason, I think people sometimes dismiss Rothbard and consider him not so much as a, a, you know, a path-breaking economic theorist, which I think he was, but as rather only a sort of a, a, a radical political economist and uh, libertarian activist of sorts. Professor Matt McCaffrey, thank you so much for your time. Matt is the editor of the new Rothbard Reader, which we have available on our website at Mises.org. If you uh, want to purchase a physical copy, it'll ship soon. If you want to get an inexpensive ebook copy, uh, we will have that as well. And we will have a free HTML and PDF in short order if you don't care to pay at all, but you like to read it. But if you're looking for an introduction to Rothbard, or uh, if you just like to add to your Rothbard collection, I think it's going to be great. Uh, so again, Matt, thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.